by the way, in this audience, are there many people who don't understand Lithuanian? Should we speak in Lithuanian or in English? English? Okay. okay so today we talk uh, more about more fun stuff. I mean, uh, software projects are of course very fun and very interesting. Uh, but boys, they tend to play with soldiers in their, in their uh, childhood years. And um, yeah, and war and uh, battles, battlefields are of course also a very interesting topic, at least for boys. So uh, remember this very episode from South Park with underpants gnomes. Uh, we had a business plan. It's a slightly modified business plan, it's the same one. Uh, we have resources, we have competence, but you know what's missing here? Uh, I mean, what's hidden behind this question mark? Uh, we have resources, we have skills, we need success. So one thing which is missing, to my mind, is motivation. Uh, le let's say there are two competing teams on the similar goals uh, and similar resources and skills, but uh, my bet would be that the winning team will be the one with better motivation. That's sort of Captain Obvious, right? Uh, IT professionals, uh, they can do so much more than they have the right drive. Motivated developers, they just overcome all odds and they just deliver. Overcoming other po uh, so impossible impediments, it seems. So motivated teams win, the motivated teams, they just happy to accept defeat. Uh, what hardships IT people can overcome? I think we all uh, hear from IT background. I think it's a uh, uh, similar experience for many of us. I very much remember my own uh, times when I, uh, I had very m motivated team. So we could work uh, eight hours a day <laughs> or whatever hours a day. Uh, we, could, we could work 36 hours straight, skipping lunch, skipping pizza, skipping dates, skipping yeah, <laughs> bathing. <laughs> uh, and still we used to perform best code, best quality, best performance. Uh, and we still felt very much excited. So I think I'm not the only one like this. A lot of people had the same experience, uh, at least in this room. Uh, motivating environments are hard to create. It's easy to destroy. Uh, remember the agile gods? Some times ago, they gave us the Agile commandments. And one of these commandments, or actually three of these commandments, they circus around motivation. Motivated individuals, trusting job done, and, um, and having self-organized teams. Scrum, in my mind, is particularly efficient because it intentionally creates environment where uh, working conditions where motivation is at the core of the very process. Uh, daily stand-ups and scrum boards will increase peer pressure. So I, I know that people see what I did or what I haven't done and I see what others do and so we compete, we compete to be the best. Um, we solve problems uh, at daily stand-ups, we have a saying grooming and estimations uh, and we often say we as a team decide, right? So. Uh, this is the very core of I, what I understand self-organizing teams. There's no one telling me, no one telling anyone what to do, who's doing what. We as a team decide. We as a team think that you're the best guy to, uh, to communicate with customer, for instance. And that's the point about trusting work done. We have backlog and we know that people will, motivated people will uh, do a job uh, in best possible manner. And there is hard evidence that Scrum teams succeed, win, and uh, uh, others don't. So these practices are working. There is very hard evidence for it. Uh, you know, IT industry was, uh, for at least last three decades, it was a bit special. Uh, it's, uh, there's universal shortage of engineers, and it's globally, and uh, salaries are okay. Uh, there's a lot of jobs to choose from if you go to IT specialist. Uh, no one is actually forced to work for something which we don't like, so mean management is more or less extent. Everyone uh, learns at least to respect software developers. So yeah, IT people are sort of exception in our economy. Uh, I'm not offended by this picture because I myself had developer <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm proud of developer. 
but it's pretty much like outsiders can see us. So if we think that we have found something in, um, uh, in this um, agile way of doing agile thing, agile management, uh, agile, agile way of organizing things, so it's, well, human psychology, human sociology is the same everywhere. Probably the same practices should be applicable in vast areas outside IT, right? Um, like ballet, for instance. <laughs> Um, can we get some inspiration or can we apply scrum methods to ballet? Uh, you know, uh, Arnie, if you've seen <laughs> the movie, Pumping Iron, he was uh, very much trying to get more inspiration from, uh, uh, from ballet. He was training. And if Arnie was able to draw some inspiration from uh, a field which is uh, vastly different uh, to bodybuilding, why shouldn't we uh, be, uh, uh, be looking outside the box. Uh, but really, I'm kidding. Uh, ballet may be interesting for, uh, for Arnie, but for me, uh, war is more interesting. War, artillery, infantry, you know, uh, environment where many peoples die in large quantities in very short time, and we kill other peoples <laughs> in large quantity, lots of time, in a short time. So, can we see, can we take something, uh, can we draw some inspiration from battlefield? Uh, that's what my presentation from now on is focusing about. Um, <coughs> when, uh, when I see puzzle faces, <laughs> when I say what, what I'm about to, uh, to, to talk about, uh, a lot of people say, okay, but war is war, it's totally different and uh, we should probably focus a bit more on IT software development, perhaps, maybe. Uh, but you know, uh, there's medieval Chinese war genius or war authority, and uh, this book is constantly in top list of, uh, for business executives. So if business people, if business executives, sales people, and uh, I don't know, sell, uh, chief financial officers, they know they have something to learn from Sun Tzu, uh, then probably uh, contemporary uh, battlefield experience or battlefield best practices can be, uh, can be used for software guys. IT guys. You know, American soldiers in Afghanistan, even though we have these space age uh, modern military technologies, they still find something to learn even from the enemy, from the Taliban. If those NATO soldiers have to learn, have something to learn from medieval, you know, uh, desert people, uh, and if business executives can learn something from medieval uh, Chinese warfare, I think we can learn something from World War I. Uh, some of the uh, commandments which Agile Gods gave us was about iterations, right? They pretty much said, do things iteratively. And uh, yeah, in World War I, it, this principle wasn't always followed. Uh, like, uh, there was in Western Front, when France was fighting against Germans, uh, there was this Nivelle Offensive. It was a battle, a protracted battle. It was planned in a waterfall manner. And they planned, well, to have 10,000 people killed uh, in French size, uh, on French side and, and have a uh, uh, crucial uh, breakthrough. In fact, uh, there was 187,000 people killed. And it wasn't because Germany used better weapons or anything, but it was probably a planning problem. Uh, French cannons were shooting in their own troops for a long time, for weeks, uh, and uh, they didn't just stop. They didn't pull a plug after 10,000, 20,000, after 100,000. Um, and the general who planned this offensive, he, well, he was about to continue. Luckily, afterwards, and well, in general, military has learned from these mistakes. Uh, universally, armies try to be very adaptive to the situation, and especially in the battlefield, of course, and they typically develop their offensive step by step. They take this objective, this, if they fail, they retreat, they, they try other ways. And they change the tactical plans according to the situation. Uh, this is why U.S. Army is not new to the idea of iterative software development. U.S. Army, for instance, uh, they apply incremental development model in software. 
this is excerpt from Department of Defense standard document, uh, which says that software should be produced in iterative, incremental fashion. Right, and remember that this was in 1985. Agile and Scrum uh, wasn't heard about it. So military people, they do things in iterations, and we find that uh, uh, there's value in it. Uh, now let's look if we can find something else, some more similarities between IT and, and military. Uh, what is demotivating for IT people is uh, yeah, boring assignment, uh, uh, boring project, uh, team which is not very funny, uh, or, or paper jam, a printer machine, I mean all these things can, uh, can, can create hell in your uh, working place. But then you contrast it with, uh, uh, with what we have in, on front line. A bad day can be a bit worse, slightly. You, can, uh, you sleep in freezing mud, you don't have hygiene too much. Uh, your colleagues are killed, wounded, um, there's pain, you can be killed. And yeah, if day is really bad, you can end up in, in, in firing squad, in, in, in wrong side of firing squad. So the environments at least are different, right? <laughs> Also not a brainer. But the motivation, despite such working environment, motivation is still there. At least in First World War I and afterwards and, and before it, British Army was composed from volunteers initially. So they had so many people willing to die in battlefields uh, that uh, yeah, they can choose from. And of course, the people saw volunteers. They were willing to go to environment like this and, uh, and participate in such projects. Of course, when uh, war wasn't going as expected, they had people drafted, recruited, but uh, still uh, motivation is there in the, in the army. So that's the second uh, similarity between IT and army, that army people, or military people, and IT people, they pretty much know uh, the value of motivation. Uh, guerrilla, ar guerrilla armies or guerrilla group groups, they are made up only from uh, volunteers. They made up from uh, people who know the risks and hardships, but they still go on, they still join armies and they still, uh, uh, and they still, go on, uh, still stay. And uh, guerrilla armies are made up only from very motivated people, because if you're not motivated, you stay home. <coughs> so only motivated stays. So that's the third similarity between military and software, right? If you fast team, if, if, you, if you have fast teams who move fast, adopt, then there's agile, both in software, both in military. Uh, but, you know, in the last 300 years, a lot of uh, insurgents, a lot of guerrillas, they followed the same pattern. First, they were very small, self-organized, highly motivated teams, pretty much scrum teams, right? And then they all died and lost a battle, or they won and they grew in size, they won again, 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 again. And if they are not killed, all of them, eventually they reach the size of really a large military force, professional. Uh, like American War of Independence, initially it was small insurgent groups from farmers, and then they developed into the biggest uh, military might, what we see now. Processes, structure, everything is very different between uh, farmers, farmer gangs, and, and the armies. In each case, small agile guerrilla teams, they evolve into what is known a proper way to run military. Uh, they turn from small democratic gangs into, discipline, into disciplined military units. And, uh, you know, you can no longer argue with your boss, you cannot longer vote for your sergeant in proper army. And this is because the army, the principle of army is immediate ob obedience to, to orders. Uh, you swear that you will follow the orders and uh, there's very strict subordination, there's very strict discipline. Uh, no one's caring about your opinions and your civil rights are a bit restricted. Uh, actually, when you start an army, you start with humiliation. They st uh, at your training, we start to, by telling you that you should obey whatever, uh, whatever law you get. And uh, sometimes we can see what goes wrong. 
then uh, there's no more officers. This is Russian paratroopers having fun. They have one day off. Uh, then uh, the paratrooper days, and yeah, there's, uh, you should be staying indoors on that day. Uh, so, uh, uh, if self-organizing uh, teams, uh, uh, you know, uh, if these soldiers would self-organize and would get weapons, uh, it would get out of hand, probably. Uh, so, probably, or the common knowledge is that large military force, which can win battles, uh, doesn't mix with self-organizing teams. You have to go top-down, um, hierarchy, and so on. But uh, luckily, we can look at look at back at history 100 years ago, and we could see, uh, we could look at experiment which was happening for large military forces and who tried to be self-organized. I need to start with a disclaimer uh, before I proceed, because every time I talk about these things, guys come back with, to me with the same question: Are you Latvian? <laughs> no, I'm not. It's we must agree, I'm not related to Latvians. I don't know much Latvians. I'm totally unbiased towards them. I, I analyze this one just to uh, get inspiration about um, team psychology in, in, in quite opposite uh, fields of business. And there's another disclaimer. I'm really not lefty. I'm not really about communists or such things. I'm very happy that communism is gone, finally. Again, this is just to draw some inspiration. Uh, with these disclaimers done, here's what we talk about. World War I. Uh, the mission of World War I was not to kill other king or other emperor. Actually, three of these guys were cousins. They were good cousins. They met often. They were very on good terms. Uh, yeah, we had very strange facial hair. But they went into this fight, they went into these battle, bloody battles to maximize their honor. And if you would be participant in World War I uh, project, so to say, your project, your mission was to die, so these guys get more honor. Yeah, it was okay, it was just uh, like this. Uh, so here what was happening from Russian side, from Russian Empire side. Uh, we allocated here, approximately, right? So a front line was here. Germans have pushed Russians. Finally, we have pushed Russians far away. Uh, millions were killed. Lots were as huge casualties. And people started questioning, I mean, is it the right price to, play for, to pay for honor? And um, if you look at problems, which was faced at, by 1917, uh, these all things will remind me of waterfall project which was gone wrong, or software project which which uh, gone wrong. Uh, all deadlines were missed. It was it should be over by Christmas, but it wasn't. It was going on and on, and there was no chance of winning. It's losing more and more. Uh, and uh, actually, the Tsar has abducted from the throne. There was a new government, but the government wasn't much respected. Uh, it was nationwide house. Uh, I've seen quite some projects which uh, were in pretty similar situation. But what people did then, back in 1917, uh, they decided to give more, uh, to take more democracy. So they, they have organized people councils everywhere, in every factory, in every village, everywhere. And uh, these councils should be to decide everything. And because soldiers were also people, it turned out, so soldiers were also given right to form councils, military councils. Uh, if you see not all soldiers have uh, uh, been socialist, even though there's a council of soldiers, uh, this uh, slogan, it actually says, screw Lenin, right? So it was very much self-organization. And you know what happens when soldiers in front line, they have a chance to vote should we, let's vote. Uh, who wants to go uh, to and attack this fortified position? Machine guns, and who wants to go home? And uh, actually, uh, almost of them voted go home. And uh, probably this is the reason why military people, they don't like uh, this democracy uh, thing. 
in the, par in, in the environment list. And then we pushed forward. Um, yeah, and it was very, very close to Germany taking hold of Russian Empire. But not all units have disorganized, even though Latvians were pushed, Latvian national formations were pushed completely from Latvia, far away, they still stayed organized. They still stayed organized and they still stayed within uh, their own uh, uh, battle formations. Uh, they had been war refugees, we were aliens because we were staying in Russia and we were Latvians. Uh, they were literate. 100% or close to 100% of Latvians could read and write. And that was, um, yeah, that was a strange thing in the Russian Empire. Uh, they had this battle experience for four years and they, um, they were all volunteers, they were brought in arms. Initially it was 11,000, but more and more joined. Eventually up to 24,000 people joined uh, Latvian divisions. And uh, when we were first in market, I mean, they were the first Army, army formation, army, army, army uh, group in uh, in Soviet division, in Soviet military <coughs> force. Uh, the first commander in chief, the first person who was commanding Soviet troops, was actually Latvian, uh, and they were most disciplined people. Remember the paratroopers bathing in the pool? So Latvians weren't following this uh, pattern. Uh, they were actually guarding Kremlin, they were uh, bodyguards of, of Lenin, pretty much. Uh, Moscow patrol was uh, about one-fifth of, 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 of uh, military people in Moscow was Latvians by that time. Also, Latvians were, uh, have created Gulag. Now it's first in market, I mean, when you first in, first, first in market, you get all the best things, right? <laughs> Uh, now, how was it working for, for, for Latvians, right? He, this is a map of uh, battlefields in, uh, in 1918, and the blue dots we mark uh, pretty much the battles where Latvian troops were fighting for. It was civil war between Reds and Whites. Reds was uh, Soviets and Whites were not. And Latvian took part in major battles. Uh, to know, to give more context about what's going on, back there in, in, in Civil War. Uh, this funny guy, smiling guy, is uh, Trotsky. He was, uh, he developed the Soviet military doctrine. And the Soviet military doctrine was that you bid everything on death penalty, and then you have hostages. I mean, your, so your officers should have their families as a hostage. So if officer is not performing, you, you shoot his wife. <laughs> uh, and only 16% of, uh, Soviet troops were actually uh, volunteers. The rest was pretty much forced into it. Uh, it wasn't very much scrum. It wasn't very much agile, right? Not very much self-organized. It was mostly like uh, running a prison. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not certain if it was water frolic. It was more like human waves. So we attacked wave after waves until we won. But Latvians had special exception because we were first. Uh, because we were, all of them were volunteers. We were all ruled by democratic councils. I mean, uh, uh, they, um, each soldier voted about with officers, they voted about battle plans, and they voted about pretty much everything. Uh, they didn't use a lot of Soviet bullshit. And, uh, yeah, this is it a big thing? Uh, it turns it is. I was preparing this, uh, presentation together with people from military, pro professional officers, and we say we cannot believe, uh, in, the, in the military career, we cannot believe that army unit can run itself, that soldier can have a say about officer, and that uh, soldiers are able to vote about who's, be, uh, who's their officers. So it's a big thing. Uh, the next thing that army people ask when they learn this fact, they say that, okay, but was it any success? I mean, did we... How long did it last? It lasts for one year and a half. It, this, uh, this battle formation, this principle uh, was apl applied, was applicable for uh, 24,000 people. Uh, we were running in pretty much self-organized fashion. And you've seen the map, and you, um, they, they've been uh, battle tested. Uh, so Latvian team was first to get the military award 
they never surrendered. Uh, it's not really so. There's small asterisks here. Uh, they surrendered once. Um, but usually, no, they, they just uh, committed suicide. Uh, in, uh, in battles, I, s I think that is, uh, yeah, that shows motivation. I'm not certain if that's uh, applicable for software, though, but it's... <laughs> We were motivated. Uh, we were very innovative, very maneuverable. We were, we, because we were agile, there was a lot of people thinking about battle plans, about fronts, so they were very innovative. They came up with a lot of new things. Uh, they didn't kill prisoners, or at least there is one documented, yeah, this also asterisk. Uh, there is one documented event, and you know, the front line changed, uh, changed uh, some city changed uh, hands several times. And uh, this uh, capitalist um, army, they had to withdraw very quickly, and so we left their wounded uh, friends because we couldn't take them with them. Uh, so the Latvians took over the, the town, and then uh, they were pushed back again. And it was a very big surprise for the uh, white army, for the opponents, uh, that the wounded prisoners were not killed. They were not mutilated, they were not raped. I mean, they were stayed just where we were located. In, in Russian civil war, it was a very big exception. And we know it's, uh, it's not propaganda because it's actually uh, documented evidence from, uh, uh, from the enemy, not from Latvians themselves. We had very good military reputation as well. Uh, actually, eventually all uh, non-Russians started being called Latvians at that time. Uh, also, we were participating in firing squads because we were motivated, we did everything we were told to, but not always. Uh, uh, Soviets have executed uh, the Tsar family, and it was supposed to be Latvian team who was about to push the, pull the trigger, but it wasn't. Latvians, yeah, they decided they want to do something else. No one knows how it was if, exactly, but it's at least that's the standing theory. Oh yeah, there's more documented evidence about their reputation about how this team of self-organized large team performed. Here's a decree of this guy. I don't know if you still remember him. Funny guy, funny beard. Uh, uh, here, this is one of his decrees. He says that, okay, 400 people must go together with Stalin and 100 of them must be Latins. Uh, there's more, there's actually a lot of documented evidence. Uh, there was inspection in, uh, at, at one uh, segment of uh, front. Uh, and, and, and here's the report from, uh, from, uh, uh, from this uh, inspection document. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of things. Uh, I'm not really fond of Latvians, I'm not really fond of Bolsheviks, Soviets, so I think we safe now to say that uh, motivated adults can self-organize. If they're motivated, they can self-organize. 24,000 people in a uh, in very critical environment, in a situation where they've been shot at, that they are shooting themselves, they get killed, we can self-organize and we can drive. Uh, so uh, even though it's not in most modern military doctrines, right? The officers must be appointed, you cannot vote your, elect uh, your officers. Uh, still, uh, this is possible. Uh, yeah, and uh, how did it end? Uh, yeah, they won war for Soviets. Actually, it, it didn't last long. A year and a half afterwards, when the war was almost won, uh, Soviets have reorganized them into traditional waterfall manner or prison manner. Uh, but after winning the war, 11,000 of them troops, they, the ones who returned, they got back to, to Latvia. Actually, some stayed, but uh, they, most of them died later on. They created regime and they died from it in the same gulags that we were creating. Uh, remember this guy from South Park, Stan Marsh? At the end of most of the episode, he stands up and says, uh, you see, I learned something today. <laughs> so uh, what we learned today, I hope, is that uh, Arnie was taking ballet practices 
And if that was inspirational for him, then probably we can also have some inspiration outside uh, traditional software world. We also learned that uh, Department of Defense uh, knows value of iterative development. Uh, we learned that we can trust people to self-organize themselves. And we learned that sometimes the result we didn't like. Anyway, it's my belief that if 24,000 people could, could run themselves properly and uh, deliver best results, probably we can also trust work to software developers. If they know goals, if they motivated people, they can do stuff. So good luck in your trenches. Thanks.